we will get started now. Um, I'm talking with Tia Slightam. Is that how you pronounce it? Slightam. Slightam. Okay. Um, she is a parenting coach. She has excellent resources on her Instagram, on her website. If you don't already follow her, definitely go follow. Um, today, so this is the second hot topic episode where we're talking about a specific thing. And I asked Tia if she would talk to me about toddlers hitting because Milo has started hitting. Um, I, I feel like the first time it happened, it's very shocking because you're like, where did this come from? Where did you learn this? <laughs> and I'm guessing he learns it at daycare from other kids. Um, but yeah, so at first, because he's so small, you know, he obviously doesn't hurt us when he goes to hit us and he doesn't even know how to do it very well. Um, but it's still like, it's upsetting when your child is hitting you, especially when they're hitting you out of anger and it's not like to play. So, you know, we try and just like distract him. We try and like, sometimes I'll catch his arm, like in the, the motion of hitting. Um, but yeah, I, I really don't know how to address it, especially because when we do try and address it, it seems like that triggers him to keep hitting. It's almost like he knows that we don't want him to, so then he's going to keep doing it and do it more. Yeah. Um, so what is typically your advice for parents when toddlers start hitting? Yeah, it's such a good question. And it's one that comes up a lot because when we see our kids do certain things, we take direct offense. We're like, how is my kid doing this? Is, this? is this a reflection of my parenting? I'm not hitting him. Why would he act like this? And then we try and stop it and it makes behaviors worse. And the reason that usually happens is because parenting truly is a learned skill. It's not intuitive. So the things that we think to do that make logical sense in our brain, um, timeouts, yelling, taking things away. It all seems like it would knock some sense into our kids to be like, stop doing that, but it makes them do it more. Um, and so that's where understanding the skills around parenting come into play. So when, for example, you say, sometimes we react or we grab his arm and then he hits us more, what happens there is we try and stop a behavior, uh, trying to do the right thing, coming from the right place, but what we do is we overpower our kids. So yeah. we're bigger, we're stronger, we can grab your hand, we can tell you to stop, we can pick you up and move you, we can do all these things that we wanna do because we're bigger, stronger, and we can. That's not what we wanna role model to our kids because what happens is, after they leave infant stage and they go to toddlerhood, they're like, um, no, you can't, I'm the boss, don't tell me what to do, don't think you can grab my arm and I'm not gonna hit back. And so now they're like, bring it on, bring it on mom and dad, try and battle me on this. And then we battle back because we're bigger, we're stronger, we, we're the parent. And now you just cycle in and out, whether it's hitting, not listening, homework, refusing to cooperate, potty training, sleep, meal times. It's all about boundaries, expectations, and following through from discipline versus punishment. So that's sort of the background on some of that information on why you see it repeating itself. So for a while, and I can totally understand what you're saying, because I think about, you know, even if my husband like holds me to try and tickle me or something, I'm like, oh, really? You think yeah. you can, you yeah. know, like, bring it on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you can't do this. So I totally understand that. Like when you said that, but for the longest time when he was a lot younger and this first started, we would do the, you know, gentle hands, like gentle to mommy, gentle to daddy, because he wasn't as verbal at that mm -hmm. point, um, which, you know, I don't really think, I think sometimes he would, you know, like do the gentle touch and, but now I find he's two and a half. So he's more verbal. He's, you know, he understands better. He gets a lot more angry and like has okay. more kind of tantrum behaviors. Uh, and that's when it comes out. And then I don't find like the gentle hands thing to be effective anymore. Mm -hmm. So now we're kind of just like, we don't know what to yeah. do. And I wanted to point out for people who are listening, there's situations where he hits and it's more calm, you know, like, it's just kind of like, like he's not, you know, in a tantrum like moment. And then there's times where it's more out of control and like, he's not even listening to what you're saying and he's just trying to like body. hit you. Yes. So I thought maybe we could give 
advice uh, for both of those situations? Because I know yeah. maybe what we would do in a calm situation is not what we would do in the middle of a tantrum. Yeah. So a couple things. First of all, we want to do most of our teaching, training, and practicing proactively upfront. So in the moment, whether they're a little bit upset or a lot upset, they're not interested. Okay. They don't want to learn from you. They don't want to hear from you. They're all about their emotions and that's it. So what we want to think about is teaching, training, practicing, proactively. So some things you can do definitely, um, and I can share the link with you, um, but if it's Tia Slytum backslash links, um, you will find a children's book corner there. Okay. Children's books are one of the most amazing resources for parents because it's not a, because it's not intuitive on how to communicate to a little one. What are the right what's the right language? Um, what what's too much? What's not enough? How do I help him learn that hitting's not acceptable? And so children's books are an amazing resource. And in my children's book corner, there's a section just for hitting and biting. Ooh. If you read books about your challenge areas. You help your child not only feel less alone, but they relate to the characters and it allows you to use age appropriate language and it allows you to open the doors for communication and saying, well, how do you think Susie felt when her friend hit her at school? Oh, how do you think mommy felt when you hit me? you know, this morning. And then we start to have conversations that they can relate to. So there are sections in that children's book corner on potty training, meal times, bringing home a baby. There's, I don't even know, 20 different sections. And you can literally click the section, browse, click the books you want, and they ship to you. So mm -hmm. it's a really easy resource for parents. Um, when your child is hitting and it's kind of a calm moment, you've done some proactive teaching and practicing, I want you to use a really consistent phrase. Mm -hmm. A firm voice, we don't need to yell. Uh, yelling is ineffective, but firm is okay. We need our kids to know when something is serious. So that's when we use our firm voice. So firm, fair, and consistent. And I would use a phrase that you feel comfortable saying. Something along the lines of no hitting that hurts and just pause and really just make a firm statement and then I would give a choice either you stop hitting and mommy can play or I'm going to walk away to keep my body safe yeah. and now what you're going to do is instead of grabbing the arm we are going to role model that we control our own bodies I don't control you just because you're smaller I control my own body I'm going to be safe and I'm going to walk away that's what you want to do in the middle of kind of the gentle times when it's just kind of happening and it's not serious, but it's, you don't want it to continue. Yeah. Um, any questions around sort of those ideas to teaching and the, and the consistent phrase? I don't think so. I think this makes a lot of sense and I feel so much better prepared. And it's so funny because, and this is everything. Every time I have an issue and then I speak to an expert in whatever, whether it's speech yeah, language right. pathology, like it's just a, like a simple change and it's like, go and do this. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's not rocket science. I know. It's not rocket science. And you're like, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. But it, it's, and you're so emotionally tied to your kids. You want them to be happy. And so we give in sometimes because we don't want them to cry any longer and we don't want to see them upset. And we enter the dreaded gray zone where our boundaries are not concrete, clear, and consistent. And we really create a monster for ourselves. Yeah. Not because you don't want to do the right thing, you want to do the right thing. And so sometimes having somebody tell you what to do in a way that aligns with you, that feels good, um, that's a parenting approach that that you can follow through with because it resonates with you, then yeah. you create that consistency. And being prepared. I find when it's mm. in the moment, I'm like, my wheels are spinning. I'm trying to think of what to do in this moment and I can't like mm -hmm. collect my thoughts. So to have a plan before something happens, like, like you said, pick one phrase and that's your phrase. You do, you give an option. I'm going to play or I'm going to walk. And it's like, okay, now I have fear understanding of what I'm going to do in this situation. Yeah. And that brings confidence. Yes. And when you're confident, your child senses that and every relationship needs an alpha, not in an overpowering way, but somebody's a leader. Somebody's the person that, you know, they go to for support and your kids are looking for you to do that. But if we don't, 
they feel like they have to step up to the plate yeah. and that's not what we want. So, so that'll build confidence in you and also your child. Yeah. It's the same with dogs. Like you have yeah, to be the it's, leader. It's very similar. Actually. <laughs> I actually did a podcast with, I can't remember even the name now, the dog trainer. And we did a whole talk on parenting versus dogs and it's actually quite a parallel. Yeah. So, that's so yeah. funny. So okay, now so- for situations where it's a little bit out of out, not out of control, but where they're, yeah. it's clear that they're not going to understand what you're saying or like, you know, take in what you're saying. A few times I have had like a lot of, not all, most times when it gets to that level, I just stand up and walk away. Yeah. Um, and I find it's almost like he's putting on a show. And so once I'm out of his view, he's kind of like, oh, like, you know, and it kind of calms him down. Yeah. Uh, So what do you recommend in that situation? So you're the audience. And so when they have an audience, when they're in fact having a tantrum, an audience can make it worse. So one thing we have to consider um, when our kids are upset is, are, are they actually having a tantrum or are they having a meltdown? They are two different behaviors that look exactly the same. The mm-hmm. symptoms are exactly the same, crying, screaming, hitting, kicking, stomping, sweating, but they, the root cause of each behavior is different. So the tantrum stems from your child being really ticked off, pissed about a situation, they don't like it, they wanted two cookies, you said one, they're gonna lose their mind in hopes that you're gonna maybe give in. Um, and so that's when they're really gonna exert those tantrum uh, behaviors. A meltdown looks the same, like we mentioned, but it stems from a completely different place. This is like your child being in physical and emotional overwhelm. You imagine a pitcher of water that you're filling and filling and filling and filling and it's overflowing and it's overflowing and it's overflowing and you just can't take it. That's what your child is feeling when they're having a meltdown. So when your child starts to hit before they have the outburst, either tantrum or meltdown, what was happening before is key information for us as parents to proactively avoid it next time. Was it right before nap? Was my child overtired? Should I have gotten them to bed sooner? Were they over hungry? Did I not pack a snack and I pushed too long at the grocery store and I shouldn't have done that? Really determining if your child's anxious, um, there's a new transition, they're overtired, they're over hungry, um, and they're actually in fact having a meltdown is gonna be a different approach. So let's say for the sake of it, they're having a tantrum. They're mad that you took something away and they want it back. You told them no to the TV remote and they wanna be in charge of that and they start to hit, then I want you to use um, a three-step tantrum strategy. So it's V, C, S. Validate, choice, space. So you are already doing part of it when you walk away and you take away that audience, which is great. Before you walk away, I wanna make sure you always use the V and the C. The V is to validate their feelings. I'm, I'm really sorry you're upset about the remote. It's not safe for you to have it. I'm really sorry that you are mad about not having ice cream for breakfast. We can have it after lunch. That's a very common one I get from clients. (laughs) Um, And so you're going to validate their feelings because more than anything in this world, our kids want to be seen, heard, and understood. So this helps them say, okay, mom or dad hear me. They see that I'm upset. It doesn't mean they can't still be upset. There's nothing wrong with the tantrum. Have the feelings. Validate it then say to them a realistic choice. So if, for example, they're mad there's no strawberries, a realistic choice might be, would you like apples or oranges? And then if they don't answer you, oh, well, you're just going to move on and choose one and and that's fine. Another um, realistic choice would be, would you like to have a hug? Would you like to sit with mommy or would you like to be left alone? If they answer you, great. Give them that hug. Really connect with them before you direct. If they don't respond and they're just like losing their mind while you're validating and it doesn't seem like they're even hearing you, that's okay. Get low, validate. Do you want a hug or would you like to be left alone? They don't answer you. Now you offer that space. I'm going to walk away, but I'm happy to help when you're ready. You let me know. Then when you walk away and they're ready for you and they're calm, again, connect before you direct. A big hug. I love you. I'm sorry you were upset. I know it's no fun. You know, then have your teachable moment. Then talk about why you had to put the remote away or why they couldn't have ice cream for breakfast. Yeah. I love that you said that because a lot of times I think we try and implement these, you know, things that we hear about how to deal with tantrums and Sometimes it's, you know, it's not registering in in their head because they're, they're just too 
escalated into the tantrum. So I like that you said, you know, like sometimes they're not they're not going to respond and they're not going to hear you. And so you can That's leave okay. and then come back and do it when things are a little bit more calm. Um, yeah. And if emotions are high a lot, then go to the children's book corner and get books on emotions and anger and frustrations and help them learn to recognize their feelings. Feelings are a big part of who we are. And our kids, we, we sometimes think like, get a hold of yourselves, yeah. but They've only been in the world two and a half years and how do you manage all these big feelings? And so yeah. we have to really do really step-by-step -step teaching for them. Yeah. What helps me a lot is like putting myself in his shoes and mm -hmm. thinking, you know, it's not a big deal to me, you know, that he can't bring Buzz Lightyear into the bathtub, but it's a big deal for him. <laughs> like, big deal. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I like that. Um, is there anything else like the books is such... A great idea. I don't know why I never thought about books on topics like this, but nobody, uh, nobody does. Yeah. Uh, and I developed it on my website, um, I guess about a year ago. And I even just did a big talk for a private school here in Toronto um, last night. And the feedback on the children's book corner is like the biggest hit of the night. And yeah. it, to me, it's like, it, I didn't even realize it would be such a big hit, but also for parents to save time and energy to just go and potty training. You're going to start potty training. Well, we better start teach training, practicing, click the link and get them. You don't have to search Amazon. You don't have to search all those places and it just saves you guys time. Yeah. And the thing about the options I love, the only reason I even discovered like this concept of giving toddlers options was because Milo was behind in his verbal skills. And yeah. I, my friend who's a speech language pathologist was like, when you present food to him or snacks or anything, just like hold the two things out and give him options and say them to him. And then he will repeat them back. And it's a way for him to work on his language. And I was like, oh, so I started doing that for everything. And now it's like options for everything. And it works so well. Even if like, if he is upset, you all of a sudden present him with options. And it's almost like sometimes it's distracting to them and they're like, oh, I have to choose something now. And it's like what they were upset about is completely gone now. Yeah. And, and, and options or choice actually equals power. Yes. So every time our child gets to make a choice, one, they feel like they have a say in their world. You care what they think. You want to make sure they're happy. Like it's, it's a great feeling for them. It, it fills up their power bucket. It helps them feel really capable and accomplished. Not only that, uh, choices for toddlers, it, that's the beginning of decision-making skills. Whether it's, do you want apples or oranges and they have to choose, they actually have to choose and decide, am I happy with my choice or did I wish I made the other choice? And that's great decision-making skills for them so that later in life they can make even bigger choices. Yeah. Is there, I mean, I only have one child, um, but is there anything specific that you tell parents who have maybe two young kids and one kid is hitting the other? Like, is there a different way to approach it when it's siblings hitting each other? Yeah, so it definitely it's different. If it's toddlers hitting each other, you can't leave them to sort of solve their own problems. In theory, with sibling rivalry, we want to stay as uninvolved as possible because most of the time, parents with older kids, when they're fighting a lot, it's because we're doing things as parents that's creating more competition, which creates more rivalry. So in that case, like my boys are nine and 12, and as they had it, got older in their years, we had an automatic privilege loss. So you can set the stage with, you know, if I see you and hear you hit, you have to be a witness. I always say to parents, when your kids are fighting or hitting, somebody comes and tattles to you, even if their face is red, you don't know what happened before you are, you cannot be the judge. A judge in court does not leave and get a Starbucks by only hearing half of the the jury and then going ahead and making the pleading the case. No, yeah. you have to hear both sides. And so even though they're red and like swollen and crying and you know that somebody got hit, you don't get to determine who's the victim and who's the aggressor. You actually have to determine that you are the facilitator. So you say, gosh, I can see there's a problem. Let me come and let's talk about it. Talk about it all together. Help them come up with a problem, uh, a solution for the problem. Um, for hitting in our house, the automatic privilege loss, we determined it together uh, years ago, probably when they were five and seven. If I see you and hear you hit, then you're telling me that on Saturday when your iPad's available, you're just not interested. 
Mm. And then that will be your choice that you get to make. So you either hit and lose or you keep your hands on your own body and gain. You get to pick. And so then now they, they like I have two boys who wrestle and love to play together when they're playing. They do not hit each other. Like they just don't. And, uh, and that's very rare, but it's because you have to just set that stage um, up in advance. For toddlers who are younger, like maybe a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and one of them keeps hitting, we want to keep the younger one or the older one, whoever it is that's being hit safe. So just like you would walk away, you would role model that they walk away. So a lot of times bringing home a new baby and the, the toddler's kind of hitting the baby out of frustration, feeling that they're not getting enough attention. So you would just say, I'm really sorry you're feeling upset, but in order to keep your brother and I safe, we're going to have to walk away or you can keep your hands on your own body. You yeah. choose. And then you just role model that. Too often we get mad at them and we're frustrated and we're like, why are you hitting? That's so rude. Like, you know better. Sit, sit on the stairs, go to your room, or they take toys away without warning. And we just overpower our kids and we create, um, we create a situation where they go into revenge mode and they say, okay, you're against me. We're opponents. Um, and now I have to gain my ground, whereas our goal as parents is to be our child's teammate. So everything we do is to help them feel supported by us, even when they're learning life hard lessons. Um, but they want to, we want them to come to us, talk to us, uh, feel like we're there always for their best interest, even when life isn't always easy. Yeah, I love that advice. Well, that's awesome. I think we covered everything this like I said, will be on YouTube and then it's going to come out on the podcast platforms as well. Um, I'll be sure to tag you, but thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, you may be on future hot topic episodes because this was yeah. great. <laughs> any, any, any time. And if anybody has any questions, definitely tslightm.com backslash links. You can book a free call with me. You can see all the ways I help parents. I've got lots of free guides. I have a free webinar next week. Um, there's, and that runs every single month. So there's always ways for people to get free support or paid support, whatever suits their needs. Awesome. I will put your links like to your website, Instagram in the episode notes for this. Um, but yeah, thank you so awesome. much and yeah, thank you have a good me. rest of your day and yeah. I will see you later. See you soon. Okay.